Well, you know, when you think of Merlin, he, he's often portrayed as having been there for hundreds of years and watching the ages go past. And you're kind of in that position. <laughs> Not that yeah, you've been true. there for hundreds of years, but you've been, you've been around longer than the vast majority of um, anybody else. <laughs> I have been around for a while, although there are the people I consider the elders are the people who've been around longer than I have, and there are, there are a few, but many have departed this realm and um, for other blessed realms, and uh, the time will come when we will all take that journey. Yes, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a thing to consider, definitely. And I do have a perspective. A lot of Wisdom is simply acquiring a perspective over time. I look back upon my youth and I think, oh, what an idiot. I wish I could go back and change it. But then I realize that all those lessons I had to learn by doing the really dumb thing and making the profound mistakes is what taught me what I needed to know to become what I am. And I wouldn't want to change any of that. So even though I you know, say, boy, I sure am embarrassed by some of that stuff. So I think part of what I have learned and gained is a wider sense of perspective and a great deal of humility. I was so full of myself in my early days and so full of arrogance because I was one of these overly bright kids who I was just, you know, knew more and was smarter than so many people around me that it it gave me this sense of arrogance that's just appalling really, you know, and, and something very important to outgrow. I mean, you cannot have that in a wizard. That's one of the problems with the sorcerers, you know, is that they're full of this arrogance. and. Um, I'm very glad that got beaten out of me through some hard knocks. So there's that. But, I, but I've seen a lot of changes in the community, in the whole magical community. Uh, and and my, my concept of that has expanded over time. I mean, there was a time when many of us thought of the magical community as, as just witches, for instance, you know. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was what there was. And then, then there was the pagan community, which is something I was instrumental in, in bringing into conceptual being because I was the first person to have used the term as a self-identification. Mm -hmm. And that had a huge impact. It would allow different groups to unite together under a common identification, and I think that was very important. But you can't stop there. You have to keep expanding this common identification. Mm -hmm. You have to keep building a bigger sandbox so more kids can play in it. So these days I mostly talk about the magical community, but I'm also conceptualizing the Gaian community, which is much larger. And mm -hmm. on this uh, Earth Day, which we're now celebrating, this is a good time to keep that in mind, that really Joseph Campbell said it very well in The Power of Myth. He said, what we need now is a new myth that embraces the entire world and everyone in it. And I think that the Gaian myth is the foundation for that, as, as he felt. And again, I had a strong part, I've had a strong part in that one as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I think ultimately we must continue to expand our concept of who we are, of tribe and family and stuff beyond our own parochial perspective to embrace everyone. This is one of the reasons why I love such things as the Star Trek mythos, because it, in that context of other worlds and other races and other peoples, all of, them, all of us here are all earthlings. We're all the same. We're one people. You know, that's clear because compared to, say, Klingons and Vulcans, you know. But then he's got the concept of the United Federation of Planets, a place where there can be a larger us that encompasses, you know, entire galactic empires. It can all be included in that us. So the idea of inclusivity is really crucial. And, and this is one I've held all my life, really. I've always tried to build a bigger club. I've had negative experiences with, as a kid, being excluded from the social cliques and clubs and always vowed to create things that did not exclude. And this is a, this is a conflict in many ways because many people want to belong to an exclusive club, not an inclusive club. So you have to find a way to appeal to that and I think that creating a mystique around uh, the kind of a thing that you're in, yes, everybody's welcome, but it's, it's still really special. It's, ma it's magical, there's a mystique. You have to come to a certain awareness. You are exploring the esoteric, arcane arts and knowledge and wisdom, and it connects you. There's a continuity. It's a term that we, we often use in common, I've noticed with the Corellian and, and witch gold tradition is the, the concept of a continuity. We're linking ourselves to a greater heritage and a greater tradition that embraces the in, entire history of 
of the exploration and gaining of knowledge and wisdom from you know from the stone age to the distant future well the great ill of modern civilization that that creates so many distressed and distraught and depressed people is alienation this is what people this is what hurts people in their hearts this is why people seek something to belong to whether it's a gang or a club or a family or a church um, because we need that the word religion itself means relinking that's what it's supposed to be about religion by definition is not supposed to cut people apart and alienate them from each other and, and foment holy wars, the, the greatest oxymoron I've ever heard. That's not what religion is supposed to do. It is supposed to unite us and unite us with deity and with history and with continuity with our ancestors and our descendants. That's what it's supposed to do. So in that sense, I, I consider myself very religious. So the Gray School is not anti-religious. It's just that we're not a seminary. We're not teaching any particular religion, not even ours. Mm -hmm. That's not what we're here for. There's lots of places that people can go to study and explore and practice their religion, and we encourage that. Do so, by all means. But we're trying to get at the deeper underlying stuff that makes it all work. So we are we joyously embrace diverse students of different religious backgrounds. We have Christian, Jewish, pagan, Muslim students even in the Gray School. And all happily interacting with each other and all proudly, you know, using their own metaphors from their own heritage and tradition. So it's sort of like the vision of, of coming to a great potluck, you know, that everybody brings a dish to the potluck. And you, you welcome each new person with, well, what have you got? <laughs> you know, let's try a little of this. Let's share it. And we all learn and we all benefit. And we all gain from that. Oh, the first thing to do to get involved in the Gray School if, if directly is, of course, simply go to our website, which is www.grayschool.com. It's pretty simple. That's a G-R-E-Y. We use the British spelling for that. It has more, you know, romance as opposed to just the, the Western thing, which sounds dull. But um, that's easy. And uh, you can explore a little about what the offerings are and see the kind of course outline and the different departments and enroll. It's really pretty straightforward. The The cost is minimal. It's just barely, you know, barely enough to maintain our basic expenses because we're not, we do want to be accessible to everybody. It's it's $20 for youth students and $35 for adults for your first year level, which is 24 credits, which is equivalent to about 12 classes, which is a course level of, of what you would get if you were at you know, junior high or high school level type of thing. So it's, it's all very corresponding. The classes in each year level are intended to be what you would pick up in a year of regular schooling, but people can proceed through it at their own pace. So you, you can take a full year or you can get through an entire course in a few months if you, you know, level in a few months, if you really, that's what you really want to do and, mm -hmm. and concentrate on it. But uh, it's a completely at one's own pace kind of a thing. The, um, the foundation of the school's textbooks are in the grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, which I wrote in conjunction with the Gray Council, which is a council of mages and sages of, from all over the world, of people that are the, the respected teachers and authors and wise ones of, of the magical community. Virtually all the names in the Gray Council are widely recognized and respected to any member of the community who would pick it up and take a look at it. And if uh, a new reader isn't familiar with these names, they've, they, you know, there's bios and information and bibliographies on, on these wonderful people. And the Council of Wizards has also always been a part of the tradition. So, and, and we have that, and it's very fine. So this is our advisory council for both the books as well as the school. The second book that came directly out of the school is the Companion for the Apprentice Wizard. And while the grimoire is kind of like a Boy Scout handbook of foundations of wizardry, and, and many people have felt that it's, it's both excellent introductory as well as comprehensive guide, you know, we envisioned it to be something that would be accessible to an 11-year-old, but be something that through your entire life you would want to have it and consult it and use it. Mm -hmm. So there it is. It's, I keep a copy handy. Thank you. I, I do too. I'm constantly consulting my copy. It's like I put into it all the stuff I needed to constantly have on tap. And now I do. I use it all the time. I'm sure a lot of people who see this will be concerned about your wife. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, my beloved wife and soulmate, Morning Glory, we've been together for 34 years now and are just mad about each other.
as always. Congratulations on that. Oh, thank you. It's it's a great treasure to find a life mate like that, you know. And she is a wonderful, wonderful woman. Many people know her and love her throughout the community. She's been very active herself, every bit as much as a as as a priestess and a wise woman and a teacher and an author and and just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful woman. She uh, a year ago she was diagnosed with multiple myeloma, blood and bone cancer, and she's undergoing. Uh, an extensive ongoing treatment that will continue for, well, the rest of her life. Um, but she's not in imminent danger. This is not an immediate crisis, but it is a continuing one. And um, in a sense, people have asked us, well, how, you know, I mean, you're magical people. How can something like this happen to you? And the way it, we see it is this, is that our magic comes from our, our deeper link and connection with the earth and the currents and the whole life flow. And this is afflicted. Gaia herself is afflicted with cancer. You know, and, and an illness that, that pervades the ecosystem cannot fail but to be reflected among those who are connected to that ecosystem. It's all part of a continuum and we are not separate. The motto of the Gray School is, is everything is alive, everything is interconnected. Uh, you know, omnia is vivant, omnia vivant, omnia inter se connexa. That's the motto. And this is the essential core teachings of wizardry and of men of magic. So um, we're seeing a lot of this kind of stuff in our community. I, I don't know how many times I hear from people who are, who are battling or have someone close to them who's battling cancer at this time because this is the affliction of the earth herself, of Gaia. So we're wrestling with that. What we have been deeply gratified to discover is how many people out there care about Morning Glory and love her and have been pouring energy, magic, letters, love. We have uh, the Grace School, the, the Corellian tradition and the Witch School have been so kind as to create well, websites for posters and messages and, and rituals and love and an email list, morninggloryhealing.com that, that people have been communicating with. People are doing rituals, people are burning candles of healing for her and this energy pours in and and she feels it and she is buoyed up by it. Her doctors say that her response to the treatment is miraculous and that other than having the cancer she's phenomenally healthy. You know? So um, this stuff is powerful stuff and it works and it's important and we can't even begin to express how deeply grateful we are to the outpouring of love and affection that has come to Morning Glory. To, you know, it, it, of course I love her it's wonderful to know that everyone else does too because she certainly is is an absolutely wonderful person and she has poured her love and her heart out through her whole life into this community.